And we are live. Sort of. Sort of. Pre-recorded live. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, welcome back to our next episode of Behold Lore, where we have myself, Zoro from E3, alongside our lore masters, Rojan Quest and HB Fox. Today, we're going to talk about some spoopy lore, as we're going to get some more behind the scenes info on Candy, which for those of you who don't know, is our monster creature that we had for the last three years of our Halloween one shots. And those, again, who don't know the story, the first one shot was a group of young adults who got broke down in the middle of the woods and one of the members of their group went missing and they went to go locate it while being stalked by a creepy cannibal creature. And when the creature was finally defeated and a creepy looking book was picked up, by one of the members who was Candace, also known as Candy, took upon the curse and kind of ran wild and rampant since then in search of her lover, <laughs> who, FYI, was the one that went missing. <laughs> so yeah, so let's go over to Rojan and Rojan, why... Did you want Candy to be such a big character? Was this your original plan when she did become the monster at the end? Um, not really. It, everyone just seemed to like Candy and then everyone wanted more and more and more of the Halloween episode. So uh, I just decided to go with uh, a continuation of it instead of having to think of something completely brand new. It was kind of a bit of, a la a bit of laziness on my side. <laughs> But it kind of worked out because it was something that we, the players, saw as kind of a treat and some familiarity with it. Uh, or like, oh, it's candy, which is funny. And I did do it on purpose because I, I was playing that character. Uh, I did it on purpose calling her candy because yeah. it was a Halloween one shot. Uh, so it kind of <laughs> worked out there to make it a Halloween theme. But it was uh, it was just really funny that she became a much bigger character <laughs> And from what we've learned, for those of you who don't know, in our most recent Halloween one-shot, uh, we got some more lore drop on her, uh, which is also up on our YouTube in case you missed it. So we're going to dabble just a little bit on that, on her development, because she kind of became this, <laughs> this man-eater, so to speak, and then became this crazed being, and then became an intelligent being that was more or less at peace with herself and wanting to help humanity and kind of live with the curse. So kind of give us a step-by-step -step on that process, on her development over the who knows how many years that she's been around since that curse, since the first one shot. So the, the whole premise of the curse is it's originally a hag's curse. It was not even meant in, intentionally meant for the first psychopath that everyone encountered in the first game. It was meant for somebody completely different. And it was a means to create a brand new life form. Uh, unfortunately, things got messed up. A uh, certain person got a hold of the tome, tried to enact the ritual themselves. Slowly but surely devolved into becoming actual cannibal Shiloh LaBeouf. And then Candy went through it, but it seemed to have a different effect on her as she slowly started going through the metamorphosis that was originally planned started off as just like somebody who was hungry for human flesh and sort of molded into that weird wendigo like creature and then as you saw in the uh in part three she was now this quasi normal looking human a little bit taller than normal very green very leafy but having the sentience and intelligence back to her being to where she wasn't just some flesh, th uh, flesh hungry monster. Now, did you have her planned uh, between the second and third one shot to evolve her into a more intelligent being? Mm -hmm. You did. Yeah. Okay. Um, like and I this know curse, this curse was actually going to be something that appeared and campaign two if you guys stumbled across it but you didn't really mm -hmm. i know the campaign is almost over we're like an episode or two away um 
was there a certain part of the map that we just haven't discovered yet that um, that this curse was around or we just didn't investigate further what is that forest's name uh oaks bounty in the great oak forest there was a hag who developed this curse oh okay dang we didn't go there <laughs> a lot of interesting things that in that forest that uh nobody got to encounter well in our defense we you know we actually did cover a decent amount of the mm -hmm. map there were just uh, some handful here and there that we didn't discover and and one of them was in another mini series that they discovered and explored a little bit more on that map so that was kind of cool but okay yeah so she so we know she existed and we do know that this takes place years later since the i think you said 60 years i, I, I could be misremembering 60 years, 60 years after the conclusion of campaign two okay yeah and i and i don't know because she's very long lived now uh how far in the future campaign three is going to be set but you did hint one month oh one month oh, okay one month after the events of a halloween event so she technically well we actually don't know exactly when she went sane and it was fine so it, who knows what kind of candy we're gonna see if she's gonna be the sane version or still kind of creepy <laughs> but well, that if, will be fun if the uh, ritual that she's trying to cast on uh, Billingsley or Billington or Bennington, Bennington, whatever his <laughs> name is, uh, Rich Boy. If uh, the ritual works, it only takes a it would only take him a month to evolve into what she technically is. So around the time that the campaign starts, either things are going to go good or things are going to go bad. I haven't really rolled for it just yet. Oh, okay. But regardless, the, the Halloween one shot takes place 60 years, regardless of what happens in campaign three. So it's a little, yep. it, yeah. So future what, foresight where, <laughs> where campaign three is going to be picking up at is exactly one month to the date after the events of the Halloween episode. So the event. Oh, since the Halloween episode. Since the Halloween episode. Oh, yeah. okay. I was thinking campaign two. Sorry. No. So, oh, no, wow. Campaign okay. Three, campaign three is 60 years in the future. Got it. Okay. So, wow. So we're, we're pretty far. So there's maybe a couple characters we could still see from <laughs> campaign two to campaign three, at least, but it'll be very interesting to kind of come across her and Bennington is the the bloodline of of her lover from the very first one shot which is actually hb fox's character in both one shots uh how do you feel about your character being sort of the victim of, of this uh towards candy well uh, i i feel like in the first part of the halloween trilogy that was just like my own fault for not being able to make it so the character that I would have been playing, well, he died as a result. But then coming back as Bennington and finding out that I'm like his descendant and then also kind of dying, it it felt a little targeted, but appropriately so. Uh, and I was fully expecting to die in part three as well. Uh, but part three took some turns some unexpected turns uh, it was interesting yeah. to see the transformed bennington near the end there with the ascot with the ascot <laughs> so we'll we'll see what happens if we ever come across them in campaign three but uh it it was it was good despite dying two out of three times i had a blast with it and i had a blast with the characters I mean, I don't know. The way you played your character in three, there was there was several times that all of us were thinking, like, this guy needs to die. And it's <laughs> three a good for thing three. You did it because if you would have killed him, everyone would have died. Yeah, I think uh, I I had a plan that depending on how it played out, like at the very end, if they kept asking for him, it would be kind of like sacrifice him and get out kind of situation. But at the end. Uh, but you, surprisingly enough, and this is what I love about your characters, H.B. Fox, is that you create characters that even if you hate them, you make them so 
real that everyone else hates them and it's a good thing it's just like on that level of acting almost it's just you hate a character and you love how you do it <laughs> well that that's certainly a big compliment um i wasn't expecting this particular character to have any sort of redemption whatsoever but uh, i do have to give kudos to rojan for really driving a twist home with those decisions that we had to make yeah and, and i think those decisions and, and those pauses that we had went a long way to showing ourselves and the audience that the characters that we were playing had some real depth to them because they didn't yeah. just immediately go oh yeah i'm gonna do this they actually had to stop and you know consider their history and the decisions before them like well wait a minute maybe everything we knew wasn't quite right yeah exactly and it's and it's just funny because again of how you played the character at the beginning i'm like this guy is just gonna be like this the whole time and then when that twist happened i was just like wow this is some character development for this i'm like all right i would like to rescind my thought of sacrificing you <laughs> i'm honestly surprised you guys didn't try to fight candy i'm happy you didn't try to fight candy but i'm surprised didn't try to fight candy well you kind of did the you pulled a maleficent you made us feel for the bad guy and i was like why I, why okay. rojan that's because <laughs> i like having three-dimensional characters i don't like having just the cookie cutter textbook book trying to rule the world villain how dare you that's boring <laughs> you know i want to give them drive and you know inspiration as to why they're doing what they're doing you know trying to achieve their goals by whatever means necessary there's always going to be that like little tidbit of lore with them uh, that has dr driven them to where they are now. And, and I think that's why a lot of the times, or at least I feel like a lot of the times, we as players in your games don't just rush in and start shooting immediately because there's, there's something else going on there and we know that as players so we want to ask those questions we want to talk to these people instead of just immediately breaking out into a fight so uh, i would say your desire to do that with your big bads is a successful one and i'm i'm happy yeah. for that because like for most of the time that i've played dnd &D, except for like these past like seven years on this channel every group that i've played with has been pretty much kicking the door kill the bad guy loot the room very murder hoboey. Like, very murder hoboey. <laughs> ignoring role play, ignoring story. They just trying to get to the next area to get the next cool item. So it was like when we started campaign one, it was a big twist for me and a big like just a huge change because here I am sitting with a group of people who want story, who want lore, who want, you know, to role play things. So it, it, it was a welcome change. Honestly, I think it, the channel's kind of spoiled me because now when I try to do in-person D&D games for you know, <laughs> a group of friends who are more like kicking the door, it's a little hard for me to go back to just doing that. You feel a little deflated? Yeah. See, and that's the thing. I'm I'm all about the story. I mean, it's, it's one of the main reasons why I'm such a big Bioware fan. Uh, it's because it's all about story and lore as opposed to you know, and, and no offense to people who are fans of Destiny, but a, a lot of Destiny is more of just like, let's get in, fight, a little bit of story, get in, fight. It's mostly fighting. Shoot the guns. So, yeah, which is which is all fine. I mean, it's just not my cup of tea because I would rather have all that juicy lore and and all the in-depth stuff. Um, like all the Witcher games and stuff, all, all of that. I, I just eat it up. So to be part of a group, all of the groups that are very much into that it's such a joy because not only are we learning about each other but it gives us the freedom to learn as much as we can as well as develop our own character in our own fun way so it's so the second you do that with candy us as the players of course know all the terrible shit she's done and she admitted to all of them and saying oh but i've transcended it's what i needed to do to survive isn't that what you would have done to survive and i'm like oh fuck she's not She's not wrong. <laughs> She's not evil. But she, goddamn. It's just, you know, at, it, at the at her current iterations when these sort of, like quote unquote crimes were committed, it wasn't done out of malice. It was just done because that's what she needed to do to get by day to day. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the things that really gave um, Kaleem, uh, my character, pause when she was speaking. Uh, he's like, in his mind, he's like, I don't, I don't agree with anything she's saying, but she does have a point. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why my blood hunter was in the same boat. Obviously, he's not, you know, a, a huge fan of Sunbro compared to Kaleem and everything, but he still is a blood hunter and he's still a knight and he has a duty. So everything she was saying was like, well, I don't necessarily agree with you going kind of on a murder spree. Yes, you were surviving, but you still killed people. But you're also making good points. Oh, it was just. It made it yeah, very it's, conflicting. It's, <laughs> you're not wrong. I just don't agree with you. Especially when she said, and I don't know if you meant this on purpose, uh, because of the the little backstory I gave you about my character, Kaylin. But when she said, "Wouldn't you kill to help a loved one?" and I was like, "Oh fuck, that's part of my past." I'm like, "Oh, she's not wrong." <laughs> Nope. <laughs> nope, you've got it. <laughs> so uh, it, it just gave her more depth, which I, I really enjoyed. Uh, and actually, we got a question, which is appropriate. It was initially meant for you, Rojan, since you're you're our, our guest to ask all the character stuff at the second half of the show. But one of the questions actually was about Candy. And what was Candy? Uh, Candy's evolution of the undead... Uh, would have been associated with either a ghoul or a lich with a rich, dark history throughout a certain continent's history. What can you tell us about her previous journeys, starting when she gained control over herself? Also, what's her favorite vegetarian dish? So she is <laughs> technically, for all intensive purposes, considered to be a lich. Um, she yep. does have, though she's more of a druidic lich, she doesn't have uh, control over like arcane power. She has control over nature. So she's more of like a tainted um, archdruid than your basic run-of-the-mill lich. Um, throughout her journey, it was a lot of personal torment because while she was still in that cannibalistic form and being driven to eat people to survive, she was still completely aware in her mind of what she was doing. Um, and that's when how she mentioned that she was hiding at that cabin trying to seclude herself from people when that group came in and disturbed her. And well, then that third, that hunger for human flesh started, you know, rising up. And then here's, you, you know, the, just like the great, great, great nephew or whatever, ever of uh, her former lover. And so that infatuation kicked in again. But Which after, is terrifying. <laughs> after after her and uh, Rich Boy sort of ran away together, if you want to call it that. Um, <laughs> against his will. <laughs> against his will. She, uh, once they kind of like rekindled or she rekindled that feeling of love, it started to allow her to go through the metamorphosis to the next stage. Um, and once she was able to be functional enough, they she stowed away on the bottom of a ship, like in the decks, uh, and made it across to the uh, small continent that you all are on now, uh, and just started wandering with her little Wendigo boy, boy toy. <laughs> trying to get him to go through the process to start understanding how to evolve on his own while keeping out of sight of everyone else because well you know as everyone in the group even said she looked like a monster and he most definitely looked like a monster he was even killed previously because of that yeah because the the way she was described in the second one shot reminded me of something from the grudge uh, but you know, with the creepy teeth and yeah, it was all that. <laughs> she, was, she was based. She was based uh, more off the Wendigo from Until Dawn. Ooh. yeah. But you definitely gave her like the lady in white kind of urban mythology mm -hmm. about her, with like the long hair and then the white dress, and it was just like, oh, this is just all kinds of nightmare fuel right now, <laughs> which <laughs> is why it baffled walls. me. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Which is why it baffled me in the third one. I'm just like, this isn't the murder hobo candy that we met before. Mm-mm. Nope. <laughs> that she lady was n- creepy as fuck. <laughs> she's now like this lich druid, but she's more akin to like the the red hags to where they try to offer help to those who will accept it. Um, but they are not against putting people in their place if they try to uh, harm them in any way. Right. Now, was she... Oh, no, she wasn't. I was going to say, was she the one that was uh, that turned the other guy into a lich? But no, we already knew it was the uh, it was the other lead priest yep. that did the that. That's priest. right. You don't know wh- wh- where he's at. No, we don't. We don't know if he's dead or alive. There's just a lot of bodies. <laughs> um... And and what's what's her favorite vegetarian dish? Um, she necessarily <laughs> doesn't have any right now because she hasn't really had time to actually settle down and prepare anything. So she just pretty much just grabs handfuls of leaves or handfuls of grass or whatever just to get by. Because I can see her so, having a garden somewhere, the, some carrots yeah, and though cabbage. Once, <laughs> though once once the the if I, the uh, the ritual settles down, she most definitely will have a garden and everything like that. She'll probably be. She'll probably become that that lone witch in the forest that people go to in desperation when they need a cure for a plague or something. But uh, you know, yeah. I happen to know a lone witch in the forest that she's headed to right now. Wink, she's wink. free to stop by their place if she wants to try some vegetarian dishes. Yeah, you'll have to uh if you haven't already, you'll have to coordinate that uh Roja and Fox for your upcoming campaign three character Mm -hmm. with that, because obviously I don't know much other than what you're playing as, but it feels like that would be really fun and a little bit of a, a lore drop for the long-term fans (laughs) on that information. She can watch my cabin for me while I'm away. Oh, there you go. go. (laughs) She's your neighbor. She just comes over to water the plants. (laughs) She's house sitting for you. Can you feed my cat and water my yard, please? Thanks. Gotcha. Water the cat, feed the yard. There we go. <laughs> I mean, in a way, that works. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we um, we also had experience. You know, he wasn't quite intelligent, Bennington. And he was still a Wendigo. If we were to attack Candy, would he... Does he have the conscience to like defend her and know that that's his lover, or is he just kind of a he... pure beast right now? No, because he's not a pure beast. He's in that stage. He's already in that quasi stage of evolution because he's even even said words to Kaleem back in the mortuary when he said he he wasn't oh. worth, he wasn't worth his trouble. Um, but yeah, if anybody were to try to attack Candy, he would have just flipped out and went into a rage. Yeah, that makes sense. That's fair. <laughs> so back in that mortuary, had the rest of the group joined in on trying to fight Bennington, w- would an actual fight have ensued or oh, no, was Bennington I... set on getting out of there? Um, if everyone tried to fight him, he would turn and fight. But it would have, it would have ended badly for all of you. And because you... It, it was in close quarters in a very tight yeah tiny room against something that's got a 10 foot reach yeah it's not going to be good for any of you so it's probably a good thing that nobody listened to Kaleem. <laughs> oh it's most definitely a good thing nobody listened to kaleem yeah yeah there were uh there were definitely moments that, that's why a lot of times kaylin didn't talk he was contemplating things in his head he was like i was like what is considered selfishness and what is considered surviving for everybody and what, if, what is this a good or bad situation? So there was just, I'm really happy because at the end you even revealed <clears throat> that we basically chose like, I don't want to say the perfect ending, but we chose the good ending. And so now I want to know if, if you're, if you want to reveal like certain moments throughout that one shot, what would have been a really bad situation if we went a different way? Uh, if you killed Kaleem at any point in time, uh, if you tried to fight Billingsley in the in the mortuary, guaranteed at least one person would have died. Uh, if you tried to do anything against the ghouls, 
uh, or if you were caught in that surge of ghouls as they were chasing you, that was an instant death. Yeah, um, I think that was common sense. Like, when you see 50-plus ghouls just crawling towards you fast, and there's only, like, seven of us, it's like, yeah, no, I think this is a numbers game. We're going to lose. Let's bounce. That well, was, you I say think it's that was common obvious. sense. <laughs> But a couple characters kept hanging back in there when we were trying to leave. Yeah, a certain someone almost died because of that. Well, I was a knight, and trust me, did not want to hang back on purpose, but I'm like, I am willing to sacrifice myself to make sure everyone else gets out. He's just got that mentality. He's very chivalrous. So, yeah, you, and I was... you and Kel were fighting each other to see who was going to hang back, so it was just... I'm not going to lie, the whole time I'm like, weird, I have a higher speed than you. I can get out. Go, god damn it. My character will not allow it. You were mentioning it. your movement speed every time that came up. Yeah, I noticed that. And I'm like, dropping hints here, Kel. Move <laughs> it. Just like at the very end, he was like, I want to mm -hmm. grab him and go. I'm like, okay, I appreciate yeah. that. But again, I could totally outrun you if I chose to. I'm like, just get out, damn it. <laughs> uh, now, going into, like, even, like, if somebody had un uncorked a bottle of that mist... You would have all been screwed. Well, because um, we would have gone insane, right? You would, you know, you would have been controlled. You would have pretty much fallen under Candy's control, and then everything would have been purged. Um. Well then. <laughs> yeah, fighting Candy was a possibility. Defeating Candy was a possibility. Um, it was very dangerous for anyone to do so, but you could do it. So it uh, was possible you, to kill her. You could, but then the curse would have transferred to somebody. I figured. I and bet the one who did the killing blow, maybe. The whole <laughs> thing would reverse or would start anew. Um, it's not a curse that can just be taken care of by killing somebody. It's got to be seen from start to finish until somebody like finally fully evolves. And there has to at least be one being on the planet that has that curse on itself at all times. If not, it will find someone. God, it's like that ghost movie with like the STD curse of the haunting or whatever. <laughs> I think it's called it go, finds go you on. or something. It, yeah, it's, it's something. Oh, you've like never like heard that. of that? No, no, there, there's, there's, it, no, there, no, I haven't. There's a horror movie that it's, it's not that old either. It's a technically an ST an STD curse. Yeah, you transfer you it through somebody, sex. That person is now being haunted by this killer ghost. I think it calls the, it follows. It follows, yeah. And the only way to like get get it off your your tail is to sleep with somebody else. That's an interesting premise. It is, and and I'm not gonna lie. The beginning, it's just like, oh god, it's gonna be one of those movies where it's, everyone's just gonna have sex to pass it off. And I'm like, no, okay. They actually did a really good job and made it super creepy, especially when this creature can look like anyone. Mm -hmm. and anything but it's very obvious when it was someone else because it was the creepy you know they're just staring yeah. at you or walking slowly towards you you know that all the creepy stuff and i if i remember correctly you if you got caught and it would just kill you and i don't you know if the person screwed. yeah but so you had to like constantly keep going constantly get away from it and hope to god you can <laughs> sleep with someone <laughs> to pass it off So yeah, so that's Candy's curse minus the STD. <laughs> yes. Um. So I would assume that whoever had the killing blow probably oh, was no, the one that would have been cursed. Oh no! Completely random. Oh, it completely is completely random. Would you just would have rolled a die and see who would have gotten it? Could, it? it could have been somebody that wasn't even in that room. It could have been somebody, somebody else on the continent in a different. Oh, so it's town, not even a nearby. A different... Nope. It just picks somebody at random. Oh, that's most unfortunate. I figured it was definitely going to be one of us. Nope. Or the one who got the killing blow. I knew for a fact it had to be whoever get the killing blow, but damn. <laughs> that's crazy. Oh, my God. So on, on, topic, on the topic of candy and everything that we went through and the decisions that we made, are we likely to see uh, in campaign three the result of passing all of that information and evidence along to the High Inquisitor? Uh, you might. It all depends on where your characters wind up in the story. Um, I don't think at the moment anyone is affiliated with the church yet any way, shape, or form. 
So this time around, you don't really have that insider knowledge or anything like that. So yes, the information has been passed to Lisa. The investigation has begun, but where that is going to lead, you don't know. Fair enough. Not to mention if it takes place a month later, whoever decided to go, and I think for sure it was three people officially, uh, in two weeks, we were supposed to meet up with that lich. So depending on how that went down, two or three weeks later is when campaign three starts. Yeah. So who knows like what, who we see and if we interact with them, if we do see our characters, is it going to be one of those, like we play as those characters and we're kind of playing like double characters in the meantime. (laughs) I'm thinking on that. I don't know if that's the case or if I'm going to keep them because I, if I'm going to play them because they're going to have, information pertaining to the campaign that I don't really want leaked out to anyone. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing no one had an accent. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, because if I'm playing it, it's either I'm raising my voice a little bit or I'm lowering my voice. That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> it's or, still for fun, some reason they're, or for some reason, they're just going to get randomly some sort of like quasi-Texas accent for like two sentences and then revert back. Kaleem's a Texan now. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's going through some changes after everything he learned. Yeah, seriously. That would be funny. <laughs> well, all right. I think uh, now is a good time to take a short break. And there, would there, we. There's one other quick thing. Oh, yeah, no, just, go for I it. I just want to conf- reconfirm. Yeah. Um, campaign three start date is exactly a month or a month and one day after exactly one month exactly one month okay and recorded on the calendar calendar lore the, master that's what i'm looking at right now <laughs> is the calendar um is it safe to assume that the halloween one shots kind of take place on or around the D equivalent of halloween pretty much yeah okay so campaign three starting in the winter Spoiler alert, it's mostly always winter up there. <laughs> uh, it's always cold up here. It, 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 it's it's kind of like Canada meets Alaska. You may get some light every now and then, but it's a lot of dark and a hell of a lot of cold. Unless you're near the uh, bleeding chasm and then it's warm because, well, lava. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I actually forgot about that. So I'm really glad that the character I'm going to be playing is, for the most part, okay with cold. But also has dark vision, so I'm like, okay, yay. Yeah, you know, pack, <laughs> pack that, pack that, uh, pack weather appropriate attire because, uh, exposure and stuff is going to be a thing. So for for those oh that want to track it themselves, that would be the 28th day of the fourth month is when campaign three is going to start. Which, if I remember correctly, we have that stuff in the armory in our Discord. Uh, I don't believe I put the calendar in the armory quite oh. yet. Um, because we haven't fully fleshed out all of the all of yearly oh, that's festivals true. and events and stuff. Uh, I want to get that done before I really make it public. Oh, got it. That makes more sense. Yep. But that's good to know. That way we can have fun with the dates. Maybe come up with birthdays and all that good stuff. Just for funsies. But, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, mo- most definitely. Also, as soon as the map is made i think i'm gonna like once hp fox you know does his magic on it after i give him the napkin drawing uh i think i'm gonna post it on the discord as a little teaser as to oh that'll be fun i'm excited about that also i need to share it with everybody in the campaign because you all need to choose where you're from yeah yeah that might help (laughs) all right well now that we have the official date when it happens, campaign three, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a short little break and we're going to be right back and we're going to dive into some behind the scene character questions for Rojan and all of his different characters he's done in campaign one shots and everything in between. So uh, we will be right back in just a couple minutes.
And we are back. I instinctively hit guest, and I was like, oh, no, wait. We're just the guest. We don't need that. <laughs> wait, what? I hit the guest screen instead of the uh, regular screen, because you're our guest. <laughs> so because this is pre-recorded, we did ask 
uh, in Discord and on Twitter to submit your questions for Rojan Quest on his characters, as well as any questions on being a DM. So we can go through as much as we can. And then, of course, any questions that me and HB Fox have, we will also ask. So really quick, just going to open up to the floor. If HB Fox, if you want to ask the first question. Sure, I can do that. Um, I have a question that's perhaps less about one particular character and more just about your past characters uh, and the games and the worlds that you create. Um, has there ever been a character that you played as a player that you've liked so much you have included them as an NPC in one of your campaigns? I've done that once. Uh, and that was a long, long time ago, back when I was DMing 3-5. I actually brought in my original character, like my very first D&D character, who was a Dark Elf Necromancer back in, like, second edition. And I brought them in as, like, a mid-tier antagonist. Um, funny enough, that's where I also get my uh, my screen name from. Not the quest part, but the Rojan part, that was hmm. his name. Um, oh, that's cool. So I, that's cool. I brought I brought him in as like a mid tier antagonist, and like it was like a three five or four point campaign. Um, just to uh, annoy the players a bit. I'm but not gonna. I think, I think that's the only time I've brought any of my act my characters into a uh, into a campaign setting that I wasn't playing in. I'm surprised we haven't seen Toka. That's because we don't know where Toka's at right now. It's true. <laughs> Toka is kind of in limbo until he gets a new campaign home. Okay, that's fair. Yep, because I want to bring Jen come back. <laughs> okay, um, I want to ask this because it's really funny, and I want to—I'm curious of your opinion. Uh, Zara's opinion of the group changed from indifferent to friends over the course of their travels. If she had to choose one, marry, love, kill, go. See, I saw that question pop up, and it's like, Zara doesn't really have the, like, the grasp on what love even is, let alone marriage or anything like that. <laughs> um... I will say, though, she did have a little bit of a crush on Xena. But Aww. aside from that, she... I think the only thing that she would may do is... I don't think kill, but pummel. Uh, Gilly's character. Uh, Isa. Isa. Oh, Isa. <laughs> just because Isa just kept doing, like, goofy things. Not kill, but just, you know, eat some sense into her. Okay, so we'll replace kill with beat up. Beat up. Would Xena be more under the love or marry category? It's more of an infatuation right now. So I would. This is a game, say... Rojan. Play along. <laughs> I don't. You're asking the wrong person this type of question. I'm just going to say that right now. But um, if she, if we have to play by the game, then she would probably marry Xena. She would love Subira just because Subira is kind of like another her, just on a little more twisted scale. <laughs> and then uh, Iza, because Iza does goofy stuff that uh, she needs. She feels like she needs to correct her on, especially with their current predicament. All with one another. So instead of marry, love, kill, it's more like crush, friends, bully. Pretty much. There we go. Yeah. Which, which if you look at it, that sounds like a, a null thing. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. But for the record, Zara doesn't really care or really no. comprehend all that stuff. So. Zara, do, do, Zara doesn't comprehend emotion. Just annoyance and anger. That's all she has. Maybe a little bit it's of frustration. Very, <laughs> it's very Noel of you, Zara. Yep. Yep. 
<laughs> I mean, what else is she going to have when she's growing up secluded in a cave? <laughs> All right. Speaking of Toka from earlier, how did Toka become the dad of the group? And is that a normal reoccurring theme for your characters? Uh, I think Toka became the uh, the dad of the group because he was for all intents and purposes, the oldest one in the group uh, out of everybody. Everybody else was like, so one of like one of those long lived races and Tortle don't live that very, uh, don't live that wrong long. I think their max is like 50 or 60 years old before they go back to the, uh, back to wherever they were born and they start uh, uh, pretty much mating and, Creating, creating and training the next generation of turtle before they just up and die. Should have been a Galapagos um, turtle. Live over a hundred years. Yeah, that, that's not Toka. <laughs> but Toka, Toka loves little animals. He he's just a sucker for them, and that's what he sees all of these you know rambunctious little youngsters running around him as. That's why he calls all of them pups. It's like he he needs to help protect them and guide them along their way so they can get stronger. As as for the uh, the reoccurring theme, that's not intentional. For some reason, my characters are usually you know pointed at as leader, even though they don't want to be. Zara. Rockus, on, <laughs> on the other hand, is just Space Toka. Ah, uh, that's very true. Same reptile. <laughs> Um, which actually kind of goes hand in hand with the next question of uh, Brockus has mentioned being a father of girls. Have any of them due to his job become a bounty hunter? Um, none of them who are alive right now. There are currently only four of his children who are alive, who are the, his three Asari daughters and then mercy, but he has brought some of the children, uh, once they've grown up into the loop of bounty hunting. Um, or like helping them evolve in any way they want. Uh, his one Turian son actually got into CSEC. He was a CSEC officer, and it's kind it kind of jaded him in a way as how CSEC handles itself. Because like most Turian, he was very by the book, and because he was very by the book, he ended up getting killed because of it. So he's like very against just doing things the way they should be done and likes going about it his own way that way he's a bit more in control now does he blame csec for that or does he blame partially. his son okay he, 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 he partially blames csec because they pretty much ingrained it into him that this is how you have to do it there is no other way. when if brainwash what's that brainwash <laughs> brainwash Yeah, Brockus is a very interesting character. I do like him a lot. Um, this is a uh, GM question, actually. <laughs> and this seems very broad, so okay. think I'm gonna, hard. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move the I'm gonna move Zoom over to my other monitor. That way, I'm looking at the camera, and not to the to the right, <laughs> right like I normally do. All right, because this is a very serious question. Who's your favorite punching bag character to mess with? I don't have punching bag characters. <laughs> I do not designate anyone in my games as a punching bag character. Just some of them are a lot easier to mess with than others. And that's because you give me loopholes in your stories or you just like with Tiris Raven just handing me a blank sheet of paper saying, fuck me up. You know, you give me that you give me that freedom. I'm going to go with it. But I don't necessarily make anybody a punching bag character because I myself do not enjoy being the punching bag characters. Like, That's while, fair. while playing Lexus was fun, after a while, it felt old. And there were times to where I even considered retiring him in some way to bring in another character because it just started getting like, no matter what he did, no matter whatever way the group went about it, he wasn't able to succeed. There was always something there holding him down. Which is unfortunate because uh, a lot of times that, and I know some game masters don't do this uh, and, and others do, but 
punishing characters repeatedly just kind of feels like it it hurts the story a bit. I mean, because then it, it kind of punches that character down, and it's like, well, then why am I even going to try to succeed anything if I'm just going to get knocked down well, again? It, it made sense in the long run because if we continued that game, like we actually continued the game after Schultz, we uh, we were going to find out that in one way or another, Lathander had been captured. And that's why Lexus couldn't call upon him. He couldn't call on from help. He wasn't hearing his prayers. All of his, like, all of his uh, spells and everything were having weird effects on people. It was because the god that he prayed to was out of commission at the moment. And, like, the, the second part of that campaign was going to be trying to find who has Lathander and praying him again. But we never got to that point. And I kind of came in late. Uh, I think you guys were, from what I understood, the tail end of that. Was it just dropped or was it just, it just never got around to it? It was dropped. Um, sort of. Because um, Dragon Heist came out. Ah. Uh, yeah. And we we got to the final dungeon of that campaign, uh, but we all died. So yeah. oh. rather than trying to find <laughs> a way to continue it, it was just like, well, okay, you're dead. Campaign over. Yeah. Well, that, that sucks. <laughs> That's tomb of, Anni tomb of annihilation for you. We, we, yeah. we were not we were not strong enough to be into the final part just yet. We skipped no. over a lot of Chult. But your character's story does live on because my Tabaxi made it out of there. This and is he, true. He has since gone on to run the Curse of Strahd campaign and uh, my sister who DM'd that is actually writing a Curse of Strahd part two, where that same group is going to be pulled back in after Strahd is revived. Oh, so no. That tabaxi still lives, and thus so does Lexus's story. Strahd is back. Aww. This time is <laughs> well, we know the sun bro's out, so, you know, that's good. <laughs> uh, did you want to ask any more questions, Fox? I give you a chance. Have, I have a lot of DM questions, but they're like campaign three questions. Go ahead and ask seem, seems to be the case every time one of these <laughs> topics comes up. I mean, he can choose to say no, yeah, not answer. I can, I can, so I can, I can well, just, I can that's the problem. Things. Is, is most of them I know are going to be well. I can't answer that yet. Um, Do it. Okay. Um, campaign three. And from a the DMing side of things, we know a little bit about the church, uh, especially after the, the candy adventure uh, and the wrongdoings of the church, that they perhaps aren't exactly following Lathander's guidelines. For characters in that campaign that are leaning more towards the good side of the pantheon, how are you, it's difficult to phrase but without giving things away, um, in interactions that happen between those good-leaning characters and the current state of the church, is there going to be some headbutting, do you think, be between what the church says is Lathander's guidelines and what independent followers say are Lathander's guidelines? Oh, most definitely. There, there. Like, e even with, even in like normal religion, there's always you know people who are, you know, who bring up questions about th what the church says and what you know their actual holy scripture says, and how everybody takes it differently. There is going to be you know the people who are going to be pushing back against it. Um, as you saw in campaign three, there are, there is most definitely uh actual proof that there are some bad apples in the church doing things that they shouldn't be doing and that's going to cause its own sort of influx of uh disbelief if that ever gets out as to how big or what exactly is going to transpire that's going to be something everyone is going to have to wait and see until i'm looking forward to it um both from an audience perspective and also a player perspective 
because uh, I'm going to be playing a character that, you know, believes or, or supports to a certain extent a lot of these good deities. And so how that ends up working out throughout the campaign with the church the way that it is, it's intriguing. And that's, I will say this, that is one of the concerns a lot of the people outside of Morning Glory have is the worship of any other god, even if they are a good god, is considered heretical. Hmm. They're not They're not considered true believers. They're not considered true clerics or uh, anything like that because they worship a god outside of what the church says is okay. Yeah. Why haven't we left that country yet? <laughs> Some because of the players? Because you can't. <laughs> Well, that's because unfortunate. There is something preventing mortal people from leaving that continent. Oh, bullshit. There is someone preventing leaving. Can't be Sunbro. Oh, not Sunbro. <laughs> I think it goes without saying, not Sunbro. <laughs> uh, Rojan, what is your favorite... Who's your favorite NPC and who's your favorite NPC to play? Ooh. It's like asking which of your children is your favorite. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you can you pick have multiple. An answer, you just don't want to say it in front of the other kids. <laughs> yeah. It's my um, little sister for our family. We all know that. Oh. I don't even know if I can answer that. I don't know if I have a full on favorite NPC to the like favorite NPC in general. Um I will say my favorite to play have been anybody in the Bimington family. Oh, of course. Uh, because that's just chaos incarnate and everyone seems to have an example. No, I'm wrong. There is I do have one favorite NPC and that is Raccoon. Oh, because yeah. Because Raccoon is for all intents and purposes my baby. I created him years ago for uh when people were rolling 100s on random encounters and this little goofy ass plane hopping raccoon would come out and throw items at them from his uh, pile of junk. And it's just <laughs> slowly but surely evolved into him now technically being Santa. Which we all love and appreciate. We Looking do. forward to this upcoming uh, Christmas one shot. <laughs> I, uh, I have a follow up question to that. Of all the player characters that you have played on Behold Roleplay, which one is your favorite? Toka. Toka is my favorite. Mainly because yep, I, I, had, knew that. I had so many plans for him, like going on. Like, I had, he's probably like the only character that I've actually sat down and planned out progression wise where he was going to go every level. That's how you know, you know you're invested in the character. Not to mention I was a giant ass, you know, alligator turtle with a whale bone yeah. sword. I mean Yeah. <laughs> no love for Brockus. Oh no, I love Brockus. <laughs> but, but I, I guess you could throw Brockus up there too, because he's space Toka. Yeah. 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 But I figure Toka was your favorite. I you've expressed many times how much you've you've loved that character and I'm I'm sad we weren't able to continue on and learn more about him. Well, as soon as somebody grows up, as soon as somebody introduces a campaign that he will fit in, like, it, okay, I know, I know we joke about Sonata campaign and everything. <laughs> if, there, if there were a Sonata campaign, Toka wouldn't really be there because. That makes sense. He can't handle cold. <laughs> Poor guy's going to be freezing his ass off the entire time. Well, we don't know it's an entire, you know, winter wonderland over there. It, it mostly is. Yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to be there, There's optimistic. like <laughs> maybe two months of the year where some of the continent doesn't have snow all over. So that's Alaska. Ish. A little bit higher. <laughs> Greenland? Northern part of Greenland. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's hard when you play so many NPCs and have to choose one. <laughs> for the most part i forget a lot of the npcs that i throw out there unless they have some sort of like reoccurring thing or they're like important to the actual story and it's not just some random schmuck who's selling you guys a magic item before you burn his town down um, <laughs> i forget i forget probably about 90 percent of the npcs you guys come across 
it's that 10% that you have any sort of influence into the game. So you have things like Null comes back. My Q. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and you're, you're kind of doing that more often now. You're bringing back uh, characters or maps from previous campaigns and kind of finding a clever way to tie them all together. To yeah, kind of remind uh, us it's all the same universe. Withered Wastes, uh, as we revealed in the last episode, uh, pause now if you haven't seen it. Um, and then go watch it and then come back. Is that the campaign one continent, that landmass that you guys, uh, that we were on for campaign one, is the same for campaign three. Mainly because I planned out this this entire area and then we never got around to it because a certain someone, you know, awoke an old one. So instead of going back through and creating a brand new map and everything like that it's like here is this completely unexplored land space except for like the bottom 20 miles that's crazy i'm excited that we're we're planning on having a map released for that as well so yeah. See, be i didn't i didn't really expect cool. weirds to use the vizier card for that if that if that didn't happen you guys weren't even going to like realize where the hell you were until you got down to that it got down to the city and you saw the uh, hollowed out exoskeleton of zatrot with um the fang embedded into his head and the glint of the necklace just kind of like shimmering off of it so it, it was an early reveal but at the same time that means everyone gets a map early True. Which, in a way, I'm excited for because now we can see our progress on where we're going and, and kind of get a better scope of where where everything is on the map. So, I mean, that's kind of fun. I think it's fun. <laughs> um, one thing that, that's fun about doing those maps, um, at least the way that we did it for, for Campaign 2, uh, is that it kind of evolves with the game because it's almost like there there's a fog of war over the map when we first get it done you see what the player characters have seen and the player characters know of and then as we go and explore the world and visit different places and learn new things all these other locations start popping up across the map and I've always wanted, I think I mentioned it during Withered Waste, I've always wanted to do a map for Campaign 1. And I actually did start doing a map for Campaign 1, and then we found out that it wasn't real. So <laughs> that was the thing. Because um, I did a, a map for the, the Tricorn Isles was the area that we were in at the time. Um, but then stopped because, you know, I, the planes started imploding. I will tell you the tricorn isles are real there is a real nice. tricorn isles somewhere in the world well i've got that map done little by so little progress on the map <laughs> that's really cool um i actually have a question about forge is I know Forge is so my dumb little baby robot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and I it's probably hard to answer this question because who knows this may actually happen next month when we when we play Sonata Three, but he's been so adamant about finding Snowdrop that how would he react? Because being a War Forge, he's he's kind of you know no. Dead no inside. true emotion or anything, you know? Yeah, a little dead inside. Uh, how do you think he would react if we find Snowdrop and she's dead? Or even just tortured? I want to answer that, but I think I have to save that for when, if and when that happens. That's fair. I, ha I have ideas. <clears throat> I, I have contingency ideas as to what he's going to do for like if they find him and find her and she's safe or if she's you know a little messed up because she she's been held for so long and tortured or if she's dead i've got little contingencies for each one of those 
But yeah, Forge is Forge. He hasn't been alive enough just yet to get a sense of humor. He's still very ones and zeros as to where like poor Forge who have been around a bit actually do have a personality. They actually do interact with people. Uh, the only difference is they don't eat or sleep or any of that sort of thing, but they, they still act as functioning creatures. Right. You get, you get somebody who is freshly made, has only been used as a tool by like their previous owner, and then is introduced to a world is like, no, you have all these options. So he's kind of slowly but surely piecing everything together. We're trying like, to help. It's like going, <laughs> it's like season, it's like early season data and then like end of the season, end of the series data. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, has he formed any opinions on the other people in the group? Yes. Not personal opinions. More. More analytic. Observations. <laughs> Does he understand betrayal? He doesn't. He doesn't know betrayal. He doesn't know what that is. We'll find out if a circuit blows. He's just like, ah! <laughs> yeah, he's he's never been betrayed before, so it's that would be a new experience. Well, that's what I'm saying. I guess we'll find out now, I have a <laughs> if, if he understands that, it or if not. If that ever happened and he was betrayed, Durden would be the first one to be up in his face saying, I told you so. Oh, yeah. For sure. For sure. But what if Durden did the betraying? That would be interesting. He would also be up in his face for different reasons. Saying, I <laughs> Who told knows? you so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I always thought about it in my head. Because, um, again, I don't know what, what HP Fox has done with Snowdrop or anything just yet. But it always played in the back of my mind that if she was ever successful finding the cure for her people and she wanted to go back... Uh, she actually thought about asking Forge to come back with her. Would he, he have come? He yeah, would have? Most definitely. If she said, hey, you want to go to the Feywild? He would have followed her. Now, is it because he wants to just follow her? Because uh, she's his friend slash master? <laughs> or because he, he generally wants to just keep staying with her and be friends? It's a little combination of both. But he's like, one of she is one of the people he considers to be a friend. Like, her and... Durden, for whatever reason, he considers Durden a friend, even though Durden is just like, I'm not your friend. I'm just making sure you're, you're, you're not going you know, <laughs> to get yourself killed. He's like, no, we're friends. He just doesn't understand the meaning yet. Forge doesn't understand betrayal yet. Durden doesn't understand friendship yet. He just thinks that Durden needs another hug, but it needs to come from Snowdrop. Yeah, which which always makes me laugh because what he keeps saying it's like mind control I'm like it's really not it's more it's more of like a innate calm emotions it's basically Which, is what she's emitting <laughs> i mean calm emotions that never makes people angry right nope nope something something glass of desert <laughs> it's like i'm not making you forget you were angry you're just you just feel better about yourself is all you're angry you just can't express it yeah <laughs> Your anger has been postponed. And she she genuinely wanted to give him a hug because she saw how angry he was. And she's like, don't worry, you have friends to lean on. And that just completely just went out into left field. So I was like, well. <laughs> that, that was a little bit of a surprise for me as well. Because when we created, uh, collaborated on the, the racial stuff for Snowdrop, um, that ability in particular... In my mind, it was like, a, oh, this is a, a really nice thing to help comfort people with. You know, they're feeling sad or, or they're angry or whatever it happens to be. Give them a hug, help them feel better, make them happy again, or at least hide that anger a little bit. But then when it was actually used, left field. It's like, yeah, yeah no, get the <laughs> fuck off of me. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Which is what because all the happiness, and and you know from like what we've we've talked about before in the past, like that's exactly how she'd use it. She wants to be, you know, the one you can 
turn to or have a shoulder to cry on to comfort because she all wants everyone to be happy, you know, sunshine and rainbows and all that. And she wants you to be comforted. So to have, so to see him being upset and then wanting to comfort him because he's upset only to make him even more upset was just like, I don't understand. <laughs> it was, I mean, she hugged Forge many times, but you know, his feelings don't work quite like that. So yeah, he doesn't, he, he, he <laughs> doesn't know exactly what she was doing, but okay. Yeah. Lots of hugs. I, if I even recall, she kept saying like, it's like, you're so cold. Don't worry. You'll feel warmth soon. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be warmth. <laughs> we'll find you a soul. She's That's her backup goal. She's going to find you a soul. When she's done with her people, she's going to help you find he, a soul. <laughs> he has a soul. Or forged. Or le feelings. Legitimate, legitimately have a soul. Yeah, he does. That's it. Feelings. feelings. She wants to find him feelings. That's what it is. Because <laughs> like right she now, wants you, you to smile. Right now, Forge is an emotional toddler. And he I needs mean, to be a when, happy toddler. When he, when he gets older, he'll find emotion. He'll get, get more of an understanding of the world. You know, he won't be as oblivious to social cues and you know sort of but oh yeah here's the other stuff we stole from you which who knows in this this next segment of sonata we we might see your first emotion who knows <laughs> if if fox was first emotion wink wink anger. for foreshadowing <laughs> wink wink <laughs> it's a difficult thing to to foreshadow that game because um, it is a lot of it depends entirely on, on the characters and how they react to everything. Yep. 100% true. Nothing that we can... Like, like, again, going back with Snowdrop, I did not expect him to be that upset when I hugged him. And that's what people do. They just, you know, just like, they're there, pat, pat. She just yep. makes you feel better. It's like, here, have a, have, have a nice hot co a cup of cocoa. Was what her hug was basically emanating and nope. That turned on its head real quick. <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question. If you have another question, Fox. Do you see if he wants to reveal question. any for campaign is the three? Question why? <laughs> why? No, the question is why not? No, that's the answer. Fair. I don't think I have any questions that aren't too spoilery at the moment. I know you revealed it before, but I know we were very chaotic as kobolds for mm -hmm. the Christmas one shot last year. Jesus. Yeah, you were. And you're bringing us back. Maybe. I've, I'm tinkering with some things, but the kobolds are in the lead. But if they come but... back, are you mentally prepared for all the, like, just bullshittery and crazy I shenanigans? Say... I will say if the kobolds come back, I'm not going to have to worry about the crazy shenanigans because they're coming back and it's going to be a horde mode. There oh, isn't going to be <laughs> there isn't going to be a lot of, you know, crazy let's go torment this guy and ruin his porridge by putting gumdrops and stuff in it. And it's more we have to protect the uh we have to protect the workshop. You know, that's, that's, it's going to, we're going to somehow, some people are going to find ways to do that. Because the way that, the way that I'm designing it is, um, oh, what is that? Is it Dungeon Defenders? Like Dungeon Defenders, Orcs Must Die sort of thing to where it's going to be a, a phase horde mode where you have to like defeat various, uh, armies, well, not armies, but various groups of creatures in order to progress on through to, like, the end. Oh, God, and That'd we're level six. <laughs> that so would be right really now, crazy. Level six. Oh, yes. And I, I am allowing people to create different characters if they want, if they don't want to use the same kobolds. Oh, I imagine there are different kobolds one. at the shop. <laughs> yeah. There are, there are most definitely different kobolds at the shop because the kobolds are pretty much the elves in the workshop. If we do that, um, and it's like a horde mode type thing, it might be beneficial for the group if Blue retires. Yeah, Blue was slightly traumatized too. 
Yeah. Also, pacifist in a horde mode. Don't think that's gonna work out. No. She tried, she tried to heal one of her friends, and they ended up dying. Yeah. See, being having a, a support character in a horde mode's not terrible. It's just I feel like Blue's personality would just die a little bit by bit inside. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> that or we come back and because of what happened, she's done a complete 180 and now she's like a barred Rambo. I was just going to say she's just like Arnold Schwarzenegger she <laughs> covered in mud. Mom. She's seen some shit. <laughs> Which would make me actually sad because I remember a couple of our characters were trying to comfort her that one time. And we were just like, there, there, it's okay. Have a gingerbread cookie. <laughs> so you've, you've got a support system, if nothing else. If you have to go through some therapy, you've got a support system. <laughs> but that is all we have for right now, guys. So thank you for joining us. Again, I know we're not live, but thank you so much for dropping in and giving this video a watch. We do uh post this every uh the first saturday of every month uh so i i have some ideas for what our next topic is going to be but until we discuss it officially i'm just going to keep it to myself but this is not the only show we have on this channel we do have our mass effect horizons show on mondays where i dm a bunch of space Spectre recruits. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> called the Mimsy Six. <laughs> uh, which spectres. it's basically the love ship. That's that's all they're on. They're on the love ship. There's a lot of awkward relationship situations that are just. I think it's fantastic. It is not the direction I thought at all this campaign would go to. I think that's entirely the, the fault of three specific people, and uh, none of those people are here on this call today. Yeah, because there's they're they're definitely playing with fire as far as like, and it and it's not even metagaming. They're like, no, we clearly see there's something going on. Let's fuck with it further. Yeah, <laughs> and see how far we can push it. Oh, it's been I I love it so much. <laughs> but then we also have our Saturday, our longest running show, Destiny Forge Campaign Tuesday. Two Tuesday. Tuesday. Sorry, what I say Monday Saturday Saturday. Wow, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> is our Destiny Forge game where Rojan runs us through um, a lot of emotional chaos. And we're actually on what could potentially be the last episode next week. Maybe two. Maybe. Uh, we'll have to kind of see how it plays out. But I know we are planning a future uh, kind of epilogue slash uh, behind the scenes questionnaire where we and the audience can ask our players uh, and Rojan some questions. Uh, as well as our extra life goal that we achieved last year uh, that we said we'd do at the end of the campaign where we would just have an all-out battle royale, which I think we are planning to do uh, sometime after the first of the year. So very, Level very 20. early on. Level 20 battle royale. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a little ridiculous, especially when we've got like three fighters in the group. So and we can accent surge two, three times. <laughs> Uh, and then we have uh, two shows on Saturdays uh, that are every other. The first one being Withered Wastes, which is our Arcan Apocalypse Wasteland style game that Rojan runs us through. Uh, we are very dysfunctional family, question mark. Uh, <laughs> dysfunctional for sure. Family? Eh. Yeah, that's why I'm like, eh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, we are unfortunately, uh, technically that's supposed to be next Next week. Oh, when this airs, technically it's supposed to be today <laughs> when this airs. Uh, but unfortunately, we are taking it off because a couple of us will be out of town. So uh, you'll have Extra to wait life just a little is bit. Next week. Also, that, yeah. So, oh, we've a couple I things am not going ready. on. Well, you're going to have you have a week to prep. We're going to have to prep. <laughs> it snuck up on me this time. That's right. It's always in November. Uh, and then the other Saturday game is our Pathfinder 2 Extinction Curse campaign. Uh, where a bunch of circus cat pathfinders uh, go around and just burn barns and everyone else in their path because fire is their best friend. <laughs> and Azarin runs them through that. That's, uh... Am I missing it? Nope, that's it. Yeah, no, that's it. We've got some cool stories in the future that we're definitely planning, but uh, that's what we got going on now. And you can always check out us either on Twitch or our YouTube. 
where you can always catch shows if you've missed anything, short or long term. We got you covered, guys. Uh, otherwise, we will see you guys next time in December for the next episode of Behold Lore. Until then, you guys take care, and we'll see you later. <laughs>